Pope Francis has a respiratory infection and will need to spend a few days in the hospital for treatment. That's according to a statement from the Vatican on Wednesday, which said the 86-year-old pontiff was taken to a Rome hospital after complaining of breathing difficulties over the past few days, but had tested negative for COVID-19. Francis is sometimes short of breath and generally more exposed to respiratory problems, having had part of his lung removed in his early 20s. His latest hospitalization comes ahead of a Palm Sunday service on April 2nd that marks the start of a hectic week of ceremonies leading to Easter Sunday on April 9th, throwing into doubt whether he would be able to lead them. Francis' health has attracted increased scrutiny over the past two years, during which he has undergone colon surgery and begun using a wheelchair or a walking stick due to chronic pain in one knee. The Vatican had initially said the Pope had gone to the hospital on Wednesday for a scheduled checkup, but Italian media reported that he arrived in an ambulance after canceling a television interview at the last minute. Francis had appeared to be in good health Wednesday morning at his weekly general audience in St. Peter's Square. Proportions. That was Vanuatu Prime Minister Ishmael Kalsakau on Wednesday after the United Nations General Assembly voted to ask the world's top court for an advisory opinion on national climate obligations. The legal opinion could drive countries to take stronger measures and clarify international law. Importantly, the court will tell us what the legal consequences are for states that disregard these laws and cause climate and environmental harm. Countries will submit input over the next year, and it could take the court around 18 months to issue an advisory opinion. The Republic of Vanuatu was the driving force behind the four-year campaign, leading a core group of 18 countries, ranging from Costa Rica to Germany. The United States did not support the resolution. A spokesperson for U.S. President Joe Biden's administration said, quote, diplomacy, not an international judicial process, is the most effective path forward. Vulnerable countries like Bangladesh are applauding the move. The country's foreign secretary said the resolution's passage was a defining moment that could help bridge the gap between promised climate financing and what is being delivered. We hope this resolution and the consequent advisory opinion will provide a better understanding of the legal implications of climate change under international law and the rights of present and future generations to be protected from climate change. The resulting advisory opinion could be a vital input to the burgeoning climate-driven lawsuits around the world. There are upwards of 2,000 cases pending worldwide. Other international courts and tribunals are also being asked to clarify and define the law around climate obligations, including the Inter-American Court of Human Rights and the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. A GoPro camera mounted on a Ukrainian tank shows the vehicle crawling forward. Its massive cannon then lobs shells downrange. This video, released by the Ukrainian military, claims to show fighting near the shattered city of Bakhmut in the eastern part of the country, where Kyiv's soldiers have fought Russian invaders for months in a battle both sides have described as a meat grinder, but neither has so far managed to win. <laughs> The tank platoon's commander, call sign Bender, told Reuters his unit fired on Russian positions in support of Ukrainian infantry. Russia has claimed in recent days to have made progress in street-by-street -street fighting. British intelligence on Wednesday said Ukrainian forces had successfully pushed the Russians back from one of the city's main supply routes. The head of a private Russian mercenary group heavily involved in the Bakhmut operation on Wednesday acknowledged that the fighting had badly damaged his forces. The enemies of democracy must lose. Speaking to a summit of democracies sponsored by U.S. President Joe Biden on Wednesday, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky told fellow leaders that they needed to hold firm in the face of Russian aggression. He again pleaded for continued arms and support to help his forces push back Moscow. This is deciding the fate of not only Ukraine, this is deciding the fate of everyone. Ukraine has, in recent months, begun to receive a suite of modern military hardware promised by the U.S. and NATO to help Kyiv mount an expected spring counteroffensive. It's unclear where and when that operation might take place. Ukraine on Wednesday struck a railway depot and knocked out power in the Russian-occupied city of Melitopol. 
but Kiev hasn't said what weapons it might have used. The city is just at the edge of the range of American-provided HIMARS rocket launchers and within range of newer American armaments. Melitopol is a rail hub and administrative center of the Russian-controlled Zaporizhia region. It's south of the Russian-held Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, visited on Wednesday by UN Nuclear Agency Chief Rafael Grossi. It is very, very important that we uh, agree on the fundamental principle that a nuclear power plant should not be attacked. Grossi has been pushing for a safety agreement between Ukraine and Russia to protect the facility. Moscow and Kiev have repeatedly accused each other of shelling the site of the nuclear station over the past year. The sprawling Zaporizhia nuclear plant was a prized part of Ukraine's energy network and accounted for around 20% of national power generation before the Russian invasion. It has not produced any electricity since September, when the last of its six reactors was taken offline. I'm pleased to be here this morning. Former Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz appeared on Capitol Hill Wednesday to defend himself in the coffee chain against allegations of union busting during a U.S. Senate committee hearing. Over the past 18 months, Starbucks has waged the most aggressive and illegal union-busting campaign in the modern history of our country. In a heated exchange, Senator Bernie Sanders, chair of the chamber's Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, grilled the Starbucks billionaire founder on claims made by the National Labor Relations Board, which alleged that Starbucks violated federal labor law by offering new benefits like higher wages and student loan repayment tools, only to non-unionized stores. NLRB judges have ruled that Starbucks violated federal labor law over 100 times during the past 18 months, far more than any other corporation in America. Sir, Starbucks Coffee Company unequivocally, and let me set the tone for this very early on, has not broken the law. The Seattle-based company has previously denied allegations that it illegally fired pro-union baristas or spied on workers as hundreds of U.S. stores organized unions starting in late 2021. In April, our store won our election by a landslide 26 to 5, despite all of the threats and intimidation. Among others who testified were Jason Saxton, a former Starbucks employee from Georgia, who alleged that managers watched and listened to conversations from workers who wanted to form a union. We were constantly being watched and managers listened in on our conversations through our headsets. Schultz, who left his third stint as CEO on March 20th, said he did not have any direct role in firing workers who supported the union or closing unionized stores. He remains on the company's board. Republicans at the hearing defended Schultz, praising the company's competitive wages, health benefits, employee stock purchase program and other perks. Starbucks' shares closed up nearly 2% on Wednesday. The U.S. and several allies have condemned Myanmar's military for disbanding dozens of political parties. Aung San Suu Kyi's National League for Democracy was one of 40 parties to be dissolved on Tuesday over their failure to meet a deadline to register for an election. No date has been set for the polls, but they have already been widely condemned as a way for the junta to legitimize its seizure of power in a coup two years ago. Since 2021, a bloody crackdown on protests has given rise to an armed struggle against the junta, with more than one million people displaced by the fighting. The military says it's targeting terrorists and not civilians. Su Chi is currently serving a 33-year prison sentence on charges her allies say were trumped up to end her political career. Dozens of her colleagues are also in jail or have fled. U.S. State Department Deputy Spokesperson Vedant Patel. We strongly condemn the uh, Burma military regime's uh, decision to abolish 40 political parties, including, as you, you so noted, the National League for Democracy. Uh, any election without the participation of all stakeholders uh, in Burma uh, would not be and cannot be considered free or fair. And given the widespread opposition to military rule, the regime's unilateral push towards elections likely will escalate instability. A spokesperson for Myanmar's military could not immediately be reached for comment. Its leader on Monday urged international critics to get behind his efforts to restore democracy instead of siding with a resistance he calls terrorists. However, US allies have echoed Washington's sentiment. Japan's foreign ministry has called for the immediate release of NLD officials, including Suu Kyi. 
while Britain and Australia express concern about a narrowing of the political space in the country. Thank you.